Today, Jan Nepomneshi won another game, this time against Ding Loren, allowing him to pull a full point ahead of the field in the 2020 candidates. Though he also made headlines off the board by coughing and appearing kind of sick in the post-game press conference, uh, leading to people question the circumstances of the tournament. Uh, we know that Grischuk yesterday called for the postponement. Wang Hao has also called for the postponement of this tournament. And uh, a lot of speculations have been thrown around, especially on Twitter, as to whether this tournament is actually going to finish to completion. Another news, Anish Giri finally scored his first win, not just in this tournament, but in any FIDE candidates ever. Uh, congrats to Anish, who defeated Alexenko with the black pieces. Uh, MVL drew with Wang Hao, despite Wang Hao having some chances. And Grischuk drew with Fabiano Caruana, despite Caruana having a good position leading up to the time control, but ultimately uh, losing it right around move 40. So heading into the second rest day, Nepo has a full point ahead of MVL, who's a half point ahead of everyone else. And we'll see how all of the sickness stuff um, plays out. Nepo did say that he tested negative for Corona. Hopefully that stays the case. And everyone's wondering what exactly is Rajaba feeling right now? Because of course, he was the guy that kind of pulled out uh, way earlier. And of course, a lot of people ridiculed and questioned his decision. But now he's not looking so dumb with a lot of the players getting concerned and no one really enjoying themselves at the candidates tournament. Well, moving to the main game of the day, again, Nepo showed very good preparation here and in general, a really strong technical style. And Ding Loren just keeps struggling with his Rui Lopez. Of course, he lost an early game against MVL. Uh, against Grischuk, he managed to equalize in these lines, but he ran into some pretty early troubles out of uh, the theory uh, against uh, Nepo here. Um, the players once again played a pretty theoretical line in this anti martial Rui Lopez, and the novelty in this game uh, came on move 16. Uh, previously, previously, Ding did have this position against MVL, who played c4 here, and eventually the players drew. Quick note, knight takes f6 in this position is not actually as good as it looks as after white defends the b4 pawn, let's say with rook b2, black will just play a quick f5 and be able to get rid of this weakness. Instead, Nepo comes with a uh, novelty here, rook b2, very natural move, just defending this b4 pawn ahead of time. The game continued a b4, a b4, bishop to d8, and it's really kind of double-edged what's going on here. Black clearly has the a file, but also has to figure out what to do with this passive bishop on d8. So white here pushes c4, knight d4, takes, takes, queen c2, and as far as I could see, I believe this move rook e8 played by Ding actually runs into pretty serious troubles. Uh, he probably should have played this move c6 right away. Then after knight f4, rook to b8. The key point here is that if white tries to play c takes b5, rook takes b5, and rook to c1, black will have bishop g5, and white is not really in time to take on c6 because the knight on f4 is hanging. But after this move rook e8, which looks like a normal move, here Nepo plays g3. And now if black goes for the same line with c6, knight f4, and rook to b8, Otherwise, white would take on b5, play rook c1, and dominate the c file, and also get the d5 square back for the knight. Well, now after rook b8 takes, rook takes b5, again, keeping the pawn on c6 to cover the d5 square, white plays rook c1, and black is not in time to play bishop g5. White just takes on c6 here with a winning position. So instead, ding takes on c4 here, but now white goes queen takes c4, c6, knight f4, Bishop g5, the knight drops back, and Nepo is basically playing for the better minor piece here. Uh, black tries to move d5 in order to break out a bit, but it really doesn't work out. Ed5, cd5, queen to b3, and essentially white has an extra pawn here with this extra b pawn, as black's double d pawns are just blockaded by white's one, and effectively white just has this uh, extra pawn on the queen side. Now Ding tries to create some troubles with h5, b5 is pushed, h4, b6, Nepo just keeps pushing forward, and h3. And actually this pawn eventually does give him a miracle chance. A lot of players uh, on the internet pointed this one out. A lot of players using their engines, of course, uh, but ultimately Ding wasn't really able to hold this position. White's b pawn was really strong here. Already white has a winning position. 
and uh, take you guys to the key resource here after queen takes d5. Uh, rook a5 was played, queen to c6, and it was in this position where black missed a truly amazing uh, resource with rook takes b6. Uh, the point is after takes, queen takes e2. Uh, black has sacrificed the exchange, but has a ton of threats connected with attacking white on the back rank and setting up queen takes f2, wanting to play queen g2, or rook a2 hitting the h2 pawn. And the real point here is that after rook to b8, which seems to be just a winning move, black has this incredible idea with rook to e5. White takes the bishop with check, king h7, and now white's queen has to stay on this diagonal in order to cover the mate, but black is also threatening a main in two on the back rank. White would be forced to give up his extra rook with rook h8 check, and then after king takes, can bail out with queen c8, taking on h3. Then after king g6, black is still a pawn down, but has a ton of activity here. Uh, queen f3 check is an idea. The d pawn is also hanging, and black is doing just fine and has enough for a draw. Um, so other than this resource, black had no chances. It's very computer-like, so I'm not too surprised that Ding uh, did not find it. Um, what white should have done was in this position insert this move f3, which would have kind of saved him from all of these uh, unfortunate back rank issues. Um, instead, after queen c6, uh, rook to c5 was played. Nice little trick. Of course, the rook cannot be taken in view of queen f3 check, but white goes queen e8, king h7, and now strong move knight to g1. Now, this knight is, of course, extremely passive, but it's also defending white's king, and in the meantime, white's b pawn is just super strong. Uh, here, Ding tried to play rook takes b6, uh, but it ultimately just doesn't work out. White grabs the bishop on d8, rook takes b2, rook takes b2, rook c1. And for a moment, it looks like black has a ton of counterplay. The threat is queen f3 check, as well as rook takes g1, followed by queen d1 mate. But white is just in time with queen h4 check, trading off the queens and going into an endgame with this extra knight. A passive knight, but an extra one. After rook d1, f3, Nepo reached the time control move 40, and Ding decided to resign, probably in view of the line f3, uh, rook takes d3, and white can take on h3 here, where the f pawn is defended in view of uh, knight g5 check. Uh, but even if black starts with a move like king g6, trying to keep everything locked down, white will play rook to b4, rook takes d3, knight h3, rook takes f3, king to g2. Rook d3 is not possible in view of knight f4, and after white picks up this pawn, will eventually pick up the remaining two pawns on the king side, and should have a pretty smooth route to uh, conversion. So another quality win by Nepo, of course, he had this one slip where he allowed black that saving resource, but a lot of high level games sometimes have these random computer resources that very few humans would spot over the board. So I don't think it really tarnishes uh, the quality of the game. After the game, like I mentioned, Nepo said he wasn't feeling well, was clearly coughing a lot during the press conference, leading to a lot of concerns, but Hopefully he stays healthy and the rest of the players stay healthy. The last thing this tournament needs is some kind of outbreak where everyone gets sick and uh, the integrity of the entire tournament would obviously be up in, in question at, at that point. Moving on to the next decisive game of the day, Kirill Lexenko against Anish Giri featured uh, an Italian game. And Anish showed some really nice preparation here. Um, this is, a, of course, a very well-known position, tons of ideas and move orders. After rook e1, he decides to play a5 here. Uh, a very uncommon move. Most players are often playing either bishop to b6 or a6 in this position. The idea behind a5 is to prevent white from advancing on the queen side, um, but it is pretty rare. Usually we only see this one when white has already committed to a4. But it actually worked out for him quite nicely uh, in this game. Uh, after uh, pretty thematic moves here, bishop b6, bishop b5, both players developed in uh, typical London style. But this position after c6 and knight to g6 actually ends up quite comfortable for black. White goes h3, and Geary actually gets there first with the move d5. Now it's important to note after e takes d5, knight takes d5, this pawn on e5 is rarely hanging as black can take. Rook takes e5 and then play bishop takes f2 check followed by queen to f6 and winning the exchange. So I think what white should have done, going back to this position, instead of playing the move knight to g3, is actually start with the move d4, get there in the center first, and then he can meet c6 with bishop to d3, where I think white can actually fight for a small advantage here, as he's the one with the pawn center. Well, instead, Geary uh, is able to push d5, ed5, knight takes d5, uh, 
And it seems like white is doing okay after the moves bishop c2, queen c7, and d4, uh, striking back in the center and seemingly equalizing. But it turns out that it just feels like black's pieces are a little bit more active here, especially with this bishop on a7 just kind of bearing down on this diagonal and always putting this pressure. And pretty soon Alexienko falls into a worse position. Uh, bishop d5 is played. White tries to trade off all the rooks. Rook to e5. Bishop takes f4. Takes, takes. Queen takes f4. And now I believe the engine was suggesting knight gf5, where despite black's two bishops, it was saying white has enough counterplay for equality. Instead, Kirill throws in queen e8 check, and then after knight f8, it turns out that the pressure against this knight on d4, pawn on f2, it's actually just too great, and white is already sliding into a much worse position. He tried bishop to b3, and now Geary decides to take on d4 and take on b3, leaving white with some pretty long-term weaknesses here, these double b pawns and the pawn on d4. I feel like Geary really could have uh, done better here in terms of the technique. He does let white off the hook for uh, quite some time here, um, not really doing uh, the, the most the best job of, let's say, converting and capitalizing on these weaknesses. And eventually Alexenko actually escapes into a drawn endgame. He gets to play d5 here, trading off one of his main weaknesses. And to Gary's credit, though, he keeps pushing for a long time, uh, eventually getting a knight endgame uh, here after the moves uh, well past the time control. Queen takes a5. Black plays queen to d3. He kind of anticipated this position from afar. It looks very drawish, but while white was spending his time taking uh, the pawns on the queen side, black is able to create a ton of counterplay, threatening queen f1 check, followed by knight to f3. Uh, white is forced to play queen a1 to cover this, and then black is able to win a pawn in this manner with knight takes h4 in view of queen h1 check. White is able to trade the queens off with queen a8, and the players are left with this knight endgame, Three versus two on the king side. Objectively, this one shouldn't be drawn, um, but knight end games with an extra pawn are often filled with winning chances. As if the side uh, with the extra pawn can trade off the knights, then usually the king and pawn end game is a pretty trivial win. Um, so Giri pushes this one for quite some time, and right at the moment where Alexenko was pretty close to forcing a draw, he unfortunately slips at the very last moment and gives away uh, the win. I do like how Gary tried to really outmaneuver his opponent here. He does put a lot of work into the game, uh, bringing in his king. Eventually, he takes his chance with this move h4, uh, breaking up white structure, knight h3, king f5, g takes h4, king g4, f5, g takes f5. And here, Alexenko finds the right idea with king to e3 here. The point being, after king takes h3, white will play king f4. And either black has to allow white to take both of the pawns, or white's h pawn is going to run down the board, and black is going to be kicking themselves for not grabbing this pawn while they had a chance. Instead, Gary continues to play with knight to c3, knight f2 check, king g3, and here comes the losing move in the game, knight to d3. White had a couple ways to make a draw. One was to just start running the h pawn, and this will create enough counterplay to make a, a, a draw on the board. Or perhaps a simpler way was knight h1 check, king to g2, and then king to f4, and again running after these f pawns where, of course, if white can take them, he can force a draw. Instead, after knight d3, Geary is able to find knight d5 check, king d4, and knight f4, where his king and knight basically dominate their counterparts. Uh, white cannot trade these knights as after king takes f4, he's going to be able to pick up the h pawn, and thanks to the fact that black has double pawns here, these pawns will actually protect each other a bit and black will be completely winning. Instead, we see knight c5, king takes h4, king e3, king g3. Now, if black had just one extra pawn here on the f-file, the position would be pretty drawish, as white can just give up their knight for it. But here with two extra pawns, even though they're doubled and don't look that strong, the difficulty for white is that he actually can't sacrifice the knight for one of the pawns. Black will still have a pawn to win the game. And using this, Geary is able to convert it uh, very smoothly from here f2 check, king f1, f5, and white resigned, and probably in view of the line, king e2, king g2, knight f1, f4, where black's knight is coming in, knight e4, knight g3. There's nothing white can do about it, and eventually is going to have to lose the game. So the other two games were pretty close, actually, to producing decisive results as well, though ultimately the players 
uh, didn't have quite enough technique to win it. Wang Hao here against MVL goes for one of the main lines in the Grunfeld with bishop c4 and throws out uh, 11 h4 against this uh, topical line that I believe MVL had played earlier in this tournament, or maybe it was Nepo. A lot of Grunfeld players in the field uh, this time around. Well, it's this move is no longer any surprise, I'm sure, to anyone. This is the age of the Rook Pawns, uh, thanks to the efforts of Alpha Zero and Lila Zero, basically showing that this plan is something that is to be taken seriously in almost every position. And although Wang Hao doesn't seem to get much out of the opening, he is able to pose some uh, interesting problems to his opponent here. Uh, I believe MVL's main mistake uh, comes a little bit later. Uh, the sides trade dark squared bishops, queen e3, king g7, king f2. And here is where I think black's troubles kind of start with the move rook to h8. He really should have just played queen h4 check, king g1, and then either rook h8 here or just repeat the position with queen to f6. Instead, after rook h8, rook h1, all the rooks get traded off once again, but white is just slightly better here with these pawns in the center. And after a few more inaccuracies here, uh, mainly king to g8, white is able to create a very strong pass pawn with d5. Instead, had black's king been on g7, then he could meet the move d5 with knight a5, where I think black is doing just fine if queen takes f6, king takes f6, and the king is going to be really close to grabbing this pawn on d5. But after king g8, d5, black is forced to take on c3 as this queen is hanging. Kind of an odd inaccuracy from MVL to allow this. And now after knight a5, bishop d3, white's knight has been driven to c3. The pawn on d5 is easily defended. Black takes on d5 here, which I think was actually too early. And even though material stays equal in this endgame, white is able to just centralize behind this very strong pass pawn and now has a huge advantage. So once again, unfortunately for Wang Hao, He's not able to convert this one. He also had a huge advantage in his game against Anish Giri uh, earlier in the tournament. Uh, he wasn't able to win that one, and ultimately he's not able to win this one as well. Here he goes for the pawn with knight to b5, a6, and knight c7. This is actually not the only way to get a big advantage. The engine points out the move g4 with idea to push g5 and fix black's pawns on the light squares for the long term. If black plays g5 himself, now white can play knight b5, a6, bring the knight back to c3, and black's position here is actually pretty tough. If he moves the bishop away from the pawn, of course, white will grab on a6. If he plays bishop b7, then his knight on a5 is kind of stuck. Knight b7 is also out because the pawn on a6 is hanging, and if he tries to defend the pawn with b5, then white's king gets in with king to c5. Of course, king d6 is also not possible in view of knight e4 check, and picking up this weakness on g5. So this was maybe an uh, even stronger way to play the position, um, but Wang Hao ends up losing his advantage despite winning the a6 pawn uh, around this moment. He plays g4 here and is ultimately not in time. He really needed to start with the move knight to b4 first, try to bring the knight to e3, threatening to uh, give knight c4 check, which black absolutely cannot allow. Here, if black goes back, let's say with king e7, knight e3, knight d6, this is the setup that MVL chooses in the game. Well, here the fact that white has not included g4 is actually to his benefit, as here he can play f4, trying to play g4 and f5, or g5, gaining a lot of space. And if black plays f5, trying to shut this down, then white plays knight f1, and as you can see, will try to bring in his knight to e5, where white's advantage and extra pawn is really starting to be felt. Instead, Wang Hao plays the move g4 here, black plays g5, and MVL is successful in building a total blockade here. Uh, Wang Hao tries to win this position for another 40 moves, um, but is ultimately not able to uh, crack MVL's defenses, and I don't believe the engine uh, found any kind of convincing way for white to win or even to pose uh, that many problems here, and uh, eventually the game was drawn. And finally, we have the game between Alexander Grischuk and Caruana, which is uh, another Rui Lopez. Fabi sticks to his guns from before playing the bishop c5 Rui, also known as the Archangel or Arkhangelsk. And this is a pretty sharp system. Uh, we earlier saw this in the game MVL versus Caruana, which also features this tricky a5 move. Uh, bishop a7, h3, castles bishop e3. In the previous game, Fabi went for ed4 and knight to b4. Here against Grischuk, he chooses rook to e8. Grischuk repeats once, drops back, rook e8, and now continues the game with rook to e1. Now, objectively, white was doing quite fine here, but based on the uh, time 
of the players, it was clear that Fabiano was uh, well in his prep for quite some time, and Grischuk was kind of on his own here, but you can never really know with Grischuk. He'll spend time in positions that he's seen many times before. He'll spend time when he's still in prep. So whether or not he still knew what he was doing here uh, was not clear, but he was spending a lot of time. Um, here he goes d5, bishop takes e3, rook takes e3, queen to d4. And although black has grabbed this pawn on e4, white has a ton of positional compensation for it. Um, here bishop f5 was played. Uh, technically the knight on a7 is hanging, but this leads to some uh, pretty wacky complications after the move knight c5, which not only traps white's queen, but also takes aim at the bishop on b3. After rook takes c8, queen takes c8. White has to make sure that the queen is not getting trapped with something like queen c8 and rook a8. The bishop on b3 is also hanging, so white has to take on c7, knight takes b3, and uh, well, you probably know the final evaluation is just going to be 0, 0, 0 here. Uh, instead, white plays knight bd2, and the game continues, and I think Grischuk was actually doing quite fine here, even at a certain moment. Um, he is able to get uh, quite a bit of compensation here after b3. He plays the move queen f4, though I think queen c4 is actually a stronger choice. Um, both moves open up the d4 square for the knight to try and reach c6, but the queen on c4 keeps an eye on this b3 pawn, which white will soon pick up. Now white is of course uh, has been down upon this whole time, so white will just be winning the pawn back. But if he gets the pawn back and his knights are able to reach d4 and c6, then he's going to have this huge advantage. Instead, he plays queen f4 and doesn't really do his best to go after this b pawn. Uh, queen e7, bishop c4, knight b5. Finally, he does win this b pawn back, but black is able to activate the queen. King h2 takes takes queen to b4. Uh, and here, white makes a pretty serious mistake with queen e4. Uh, had he played something like queen to c1, then the position is still very close to equal. Although it already feels like black is slightly more comfortable here with the pawn on d5 being a potential weakness, the pawn on a5 being a potential weakness, and black having the right bishop to attack, of course, this pawn on d5. Um, here, after queen e4, Fabi finds really strong resource with c5. Uh, this is a nice move for black positionally. And the tactical point here is after d takes c6, bishop e6, it turns out that white is just losing material as the queen on e4 is hanging, but so is this knight on b3. So bishop d5, for example, black takes, and then takes on b3 and is winning the game. So instead, white has to play queen d3, trying to unpin. And now black is doing quite well now that he doesn't have this backwards pawn on c7. Fabi starts doing the right things here, improving his king, king to g2. But here he seems to hurry just a little bit and plays this move knight c7, allowing white to trade queens with queen c3, takes bc3, and here white is able to equalize in this endgame quite comfortably. Uh, instead, what he should have done was this move bishop to c8, where the idea is to keep white under control, not allowing them to exchange queens with queen c3, first putting the bishop on b7 to put maximum pressure on this d5 pawn, and I think it would be very hard actually for white to hold this position. For instance, after f3, knight to c7, if white now goes for queen c3 check, black takes, goes king f6, knight d2, bishop to b7, and uh, the king is coming either to e5 or to e7, and the d5 pawn, white is simply not in time to hold this one. So instead, knight c7 was played, and Grischuk takes the opportunity to trade queens, the players make the time control, Black has a small advantage here, but ultimately nothing special, was not able to really create any chances here, and pretty soon the players agreed to a draw. So overall, a pretty quality day in terms of the level of play. We didn't see any huge blunders, but rather small inaccuracies that were then taken advantage of by the other player. Going into the rest day, there are clearly a lot of questions around whether the tournament should be allowed to continue given the health uh, issues that are currently going on in the world. Clearly, a lot of the players are distracted. Everyone in Russia is walking around in masks. The players are getting checked all the time. Uh, it's clearly all about the coronavirus right now. And anyone who's played chess in a professional or classical tournament knows that it's very hard to keep focus when there are so many things going on in the outside world. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if there are any updates uh, over the rest day. But as long as they keep playing games, we'll keep making recaps. So please do leave a like on this video if you enjoyed the content. Make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And we'll catch you guys in future videos. Take care.